Hey, Ronnie. Hey, Lou. You know, it's been a while since we've been back in studio. Yes. Uh, we've been out on location for the last couple of weeks. Mm -hmm. And uh, so it, we've neglected to do an episode on the Forest Fen treasure. And our followers let us know. Hey, we did. Uh, they did. And, and we are reacting to that. Uh, and this will be our next video on the Forest Fen treasure right here on Men Are So Smart. Stay tuned. Okay, welcome to another episode of Men Are So Smart. I'm Luke Gallagher. I'm Corvette Ronnie. And uh, as I mentioned in the open, it's been a while since we talked about Forest Fen and we've done some research and we hope to bring that to you. Uh, before we get to that, I uh, just want to let you know that our YouTube show is not just about the Fen treasure. We do some other topics as well. Uh, we just enjoy the Fen treasure and the hunt for it so much. About 66% is non-Fen related. Yeah, and we encourage you to check some of those episodes yeah. out. If you enjoy the banter between the two of us and our snarky, sarcastic comments, I think you'll enjoy some of the other episodes as well. Uh, okay, so uh, speaking of the Forest Fen Treasure, we did an episode a couple of weeks back, Ronnie. It was called Forest Fen for Friday. That's right. And uh, Samuel Smith sent us a comment where I thought it was extremely interesting. He says, hi guys, just some info. You said around 1445 in the show that Fen put a copy of his memoir in the chest. A little inaccurate. He sealed it in an olive jar, a copy of his personal unpublished autobiography, a book that has not been written per se. It's about 20,000 words and printed in text so small that it requires magnification to read. God, he can be kind of strange. He's out there. Uh, maybe this is why, according to Fenn, his count of the books he has personally written is always one number higher than the number of books in print with him as author. That would account for it. His autobiography is yet to be published and will become property of the finder of the chest. Which has got to be, have that's got to have some value as well. Yeah, his memoirs, mm -hmm. uh, after all of this, and, and you know, will he get to publish this before he passes away? Which would mean that something has to happen if somebody should find the treasure afterwards. Right. Posthumously. Right. Well, and the thing about this, and I don't, I haven't read that anywhere, but it's, it's very likely true. Uh, if that's the case, then somebody has concrete evidence that they found the treasure once they find the autobiography in the uh, mayonnaise jar on Funkel Wagner's porch. Right. Uh, basically. We were talking, oh, go ahead, I'm sorry. And, and so they'll, they'll have concrete proof that, hey, I have this in my possession. Obviously, I have the, the treasure in my possession. I, we were talking about this before tape. Um, it seems to me that he has done this in such a way that you cannot claim the treasure until you've contacted him, and that way he can ensure that you are indeed in possession of the treasure. Right. So That's a smart thing. I think so, too. Yeah, very smart. I mean, just putting... I mean, not to say there's not jewels and gold and coins and stuff in the, in the, in the box, but as far as the main amount of treasure, I think that autobiography, I feel he thinks is going to be worth so much more as a treasure. What do you think? Um, I mean, I'd rather have the all the rubies and everything. <laughs> <laughs> it's just me talking, though. Yeah, I hear you. Uh, it's it's going to be worth something, and the man can't live forever, certainly. So, you know, maybe if you hang on to that autobiography until, uh, you know, until after his death, maybe you're worth a little bit more. Or, Indeed. Or you may have to read it. Yeah. It could be just a bunch of gibberish, too. Mm -hmm. Although he's written books, so obviously he he must have a, a style that is acceptable. He sold books, so yeah, right there it is. Well, um, we received another comment. I'm having trouble calling that up right now. It looks like there's a problem with the oh. uh, 
uh, Wi-Fi. Ronnie, did you pay the bill? I thought you paid the bill. No, you paid the bill on this, remember? Oh. Okay, so here's an interesting comment that Ronnie and I were talking about earlier. Oh, I like this one. Yeah, uh, you've heard of the home of Brown, of course, in the poem, and we're going to get to the poem in just a minute. Um, there's a point in the poem where he talks about too far to walk. Can you give us the exact? Begin it where warm waters halt and take it in the canyon down, not far, but too far to walk, put in below the home of Brown. Now, uh, a, a viewer by the name of Homer Brown, get it? Replies, and, and I found this so interesting, and I'm looking for your feedback on this as well as treasure hunters, uh, if, if he may be on to something, Ronnie. Uh... I mean, it's what he's written is very, it's intriguing. Homer Brown says two weeks ago, ta uh, Royal Gorge is where it's at. Okay? He no goes, ifs, ands, or buts. He That's goes on and he says, take it in the canyon down, not far, but too far to walk, put in below the home of Brown above. And he says, take the incline rail car A.K. it take it take the rail car down and I think that may be something but can you do since Forrest's main method is Google Maps right? do you think you could do a Google Map search of that map area proximity I don't know maybe 300 mile radius and see where those rail cars might be. And I don't think he means a rail car in the size of um, a choo-choo train. No, I mean, it could be... Uh, like could one be of a... those you see in the cartoons. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, and it could be a mine. Could be a, because it, that's how they transport things out of mines is Too with those rail cars. Or to walk. Take it down. Rail car. Where do you stand on this? You know, there's a lot of, obviously this, this poem is, there's so much room for interpretation and... Uh, well, you know what, Ronnie? I'll tell you what we should do. Let's back the cart up, or the rail car, as it <laughs> may be. And let's do the poem nice and slowly for everybody. We understand that not all of you have been searching for this treasure for eight years. Some of you are maybe new to this story. And so for that purpose, we will go through the poem and read it to you word for word because Forrest says that it really doesn't matter so much if you buy the book. Right. He says that you can solve this treasure hunt from the poem. From the poem alone. So this is the granddaddy of all evidence. However, right he also, he leaves little tidbits in different interviews he's done. Yes, he has. But he says everything you need is right here in this poem. All right, let's do the poem. All right. As I have gone alone in there and with my treasure bold, I can't keep my secret where and hint of riches new and old. Begin it where warm waters halt. And unless I'm mistaken, my, if my wife has still not paid the bill, that might be my shower. <laughs> uh, let's see. And take it in the canyon down. Not far but too far to walk, put in below the home of Brown. We have to establish that is a clue, the home of Brown. What is it? What makes up the home of Brown? Yeah, yeah, that's, I think that's, that's a big one right there. Mm -hmm. uh, from there, it's no place for the meek. The end is ever drawing nigh. There'll be no paddle up your creek, just heavy loads and water high. No paddle. Does that mean no paddle necessary? And he said it's not underwater. Correct. He said it's not wet. Yes, right. Mm -hmm. So, okay. If you've been wise and found the blaze. Now, Bill Gorman, who is a respected treasure hunter, who, as we speak, uh, is in proximity of where he believes the treasure to be. And it's interesting. He does a lot of location shots from out there but the signal is not very good out in the mountains. Right. Uh, but he sends me pictures all the time of things that 
might be the blaze. It could be markings on a rock. Um, it could be um, the, uh, carving out of rock and stone. So, uh, if you've been wise and found the blaze, look quickly down. Your quest to cease, but tarry scant with marvel gaze. Just take the chest and go in peace. So that is why I must go and leave my trove for all to seek. The answers I already know. I've done it tired and now I'm weak. Yeah, he was exhausted. He made several trips. Yeah. So hear me all and listen good. Your effort will be worth the cold. If you were brave and in the wood, much like Bill Gorman, I give you title to the gold. And I believe that's just it. That's what I was saying in the beginning of this episode. You've got to, he is, he's the gatekeeper. You've got to go through him to get this treasure. All right, so that much having been said, we found a website called, and some of you may be familiar with this, Treasure Net, the original treasure hunting website. And um, on this, we have some research that this website has done. And I thought we would touch on a few of these. Again, many of you who are uh, polished treasure hunters have heard some of these before. And if this, so, we apologize. But for those of you who may be just starting your search for the gold and finding this interesting and fascinating, here's some research. First of all, it is by his rules that we must search. Absolutely. What he says goes. Yeah. And one of those things he says is, don't mess with the poem. Right. Don't mess with the poem. So we did yeah. not. Okay. Uh, so he also set the parameters of the search area and has stated that only the poem and a good map is needed to find the location. Now, be that a paper map, be that Google map, hard to say. Uh, as a former pilot, uh, he knows aviation maps. Yeah. And altitudes, latitudes, longitudes. Uh, he is the only one that knows where the treasure is and what's in it. That safe Not safe. even his wife. Yep. He has the ability to answer emails however he chooses. So if you send him something, yeah, you may get a reply. You, you may, may not. I, I can only imagine with the number of people searching, you must get thousands a day. I would have to think so. I, I wonder, how does he go about choosing? Does he read them all and go, well, this is the best one I got today, or this one is closest to where maybe the treasure might be? How, what's his criteria? Yeah, well, I'm, I'm sure he's not out there playing a lot of golf at his age. No, probably so, not. And, and we have, and we'll do it again right now, in fact. Mr. Finn, we have a lot of respect for you and what you're doing here, and we understand what the ultimate goal is in hiding this treasure, and that's to get people out of doors, right. away from electronics, away from their phones, and with their families, learning about nature. We understand that. I think that's super noble cause. We salute that. Very much. We would love to have you come on our show. Yeah. Uh, we're not going to ask you to give us any more clues than anyone else would get. No. We're not asking for that. We just want to learn more about the man yeah. and get your take on things. Very intriguing. He's, he's a very interesting man. We just did recently a, um, an episode on etiquette in the year 2018, remember? Right. Right. And, you know, we would love to get your take on some of the etiquette uh, as an 84 or 85-year-old man and, and what you think about technology. Obviously, if you're getting emails, you're on the computer. Yep. So uh, the invitation has been extended. We'd love to have you on the program, and uh, we'll make it very comfortable for you. We'll come to you, in fact. Ronnie? Oh, I'm game. Yeah, but you got to pay for it, okay? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, a few other rules before we have to get out of here, Ronnie. Um, he has provided us with additional clues as he deems fit, and he has changed or waffled one very important clue, which we'll get to shortly. Uh, he stated that there are hints sprinkled throughout his memoirs. So although those are hints, again, the poem has everything you need in it. Focus on the poem. Hints are always nice, though. Forrest is intelligent. Resourceful and mindful, 
to the disciplines of small details in everything he does. He knows people and the ways of the world very well. That's what we'd like to talk to you about. But follows his own set of rules and uses his experiences and personal fortitude to set his mind in motion. Now this one, I'll, let me just read it first. He enjoys poetry and the play on words that is allotted to the art of poetry. Which means that his, in the clues, maybe some of these words have more than one meaning. Sure. Uh, possibly even, man, I was, I was asking somebody before that, is it possible that he has hidden uh, like a GPS coordinates somewhere in the poem somehow? Through coding. Through coding. Like we talked about in the D.B. Cooper yes, episode. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, that's another venue that I'm not sure anybody has gone down. And you know the other thing, too, I always think about, we spend so much time trying to decipher. What if it's just literal? Right. For instance, the home of Brown. What if it's a Brown home? Yeah. yeah. I mean, simple. You're right. Yeah. You know, that's the secret to the the greatest successful people in life, the Beatles for sure, keep it simple. Yep. Maybe we're overthinking this. And maybe that's why it's taken so long for somebody to find this treasure. Overthinking. Maybe. When I know if it were me, if I hid something in an area that I'm not super familiar with, uh, even in an area that I am familiar with, Time has a way of eroding your memory. Sure. So let's say that he wanted to go back out there and retrieve it. Man, the the best way to find another place two times in a row is with GPS coordinates. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure if he's used them. Me and I'm I'm certainly wasn't born in the computer era. I mean I'm we way predate that, but we're both very computer literate. Man, I would use everything to my advantage that I could to be able to relocate wherever I've, you know, hidden something. Mm -hmm. GPS is the absolute, you know, gold standard. What went through his mind when he found that one spot where he wanted to hide the treasure? What was it that he thought? Did he think to himself, hmm, in 20 years, this is going to be completely covered with vines and ivy or... Uh, boulders that have fallen down off of higher cliffs or whatever the case may be just you know a, a tree hit by lightning or something to that effect uh, then what so did he think about that you almost have to because and even with uh, obviously where it's hidden there's not like tons of rain but it gets super cold and as the runoff you know melts as the snow melts you have some runoff so i mean it's possible that I don't know, did he put it in a garbage bag to keep it dry? Or there's a lot of variables certainly out there of where it's hidden and how it's hidden. Yeah, uh, some of the comments on our YouTube page, uh, they talk about, uh, in, in pre previous episode, we talked about uh, sonar, not sonar, but... Uh, FLIR. Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Forward-looking infrared. Right. Drones that are equipped with bronze or copper-seeking frequencies could find this. All metal gives off a frequency, and this could be a high-tech way of finding it. What about infrared? Could that help? Some of the search and rescue tech stuff. The military has planes that can detect metal objects from planes. Yeah. So, as we talked about before, metal heats and cools at a different rate than dirt, sand, and everything else. So, if you're using infrared, you would get a blip on there. But from a plane, uh, even at, I think the minimum flying height is 600 feet. So even at 600 feet, you're covering quite a, a, an area with FLIR. Yeah. To find that one tiny little blip from 600 feet up, maybe in a drone, if you had uh, forward-looking infrared or FLIR as we call it. If you had FLIR on a drone, you could certainly fly it at a lower altitude, and if you used a really tight grid search maybe you stand a better chance that way i can't help but think to myself when i think about this 
six thousand people out in the mountains with metal detectors going right. Beep, beep, beep. <laughs> yeah, that's what it takes. That's what it takes. Right. Here's a fact you may not know. He was seventy nine years old when he hid this treasure and was having chemo for his cancer. This is by far, according to this website, which is treasurenet.com, this um, proved, hold on, where'd it go? Uh, f- uh, by participate. Far the the best and biggest clue, because, because of his age and his health, and I'm sure he was not, boy, after you've had chemo, you're not super strong. No. So, um, yeah, it, it can't be hidden on the face of a cliff. Listen to this one. He has told a handicapped woman who couldn't physically participate in the chase that if she solved the poem slash puzzle, Forrest would go out and get it for her. Oh, wow. This proves that the puzzle can be solved using only a computer and a map. Um, I like that. Um, I'm not sure though. I think, I think he, because he knows where it is, it can be easily solved by him with a computer and a map. I think you really need to go out and see some of the landmarks. And it's, I'm sure as soon as you see something, you're going to go, oh, that matches up with the blaze. I understand exactly what you're saying. I'm not disagreeing with you. I, I, I understand. Bill Gorman, I keep bringing up his name, he has boots on the ground right now. And I can tell you that at every turn he takes, he he has found nothing. He he you know he thinks he found something that leads to something else, but it's wrong. And he goes there, it's not there. Well, there's literally over a million acres to cover here. So He's got a long ways to go before he's boots on the ground on every yeah. every acre. Yeah, but yeah. you know, if you want to talk about a treasure hunter, that's him, right? He's, there. he's in it. He's in it. He's in it to win it for he sure. Is for sure. Yeah. Um, and I think, like I said, because Forrest hid the treasure. For him, it's simple, and he wrote the clues. For him, it's super simple. Everything makes sense to him. It's it's a little bit tougher when somebody else is trying to interpret your works and your words. Let me give you an example here of what we need to do. You ever play the lottery and hope you'll win and then they draw the numbers and you don't win. But you hear about this office that everybody put in a dollar and they won $65 million and like 12 people split the jackpot. Right. I don't see anything wrong with that. And here's my point, Ronnie. What I'm suggesting is this. If we all team our efforts in the comment section below, we may be able to narrow this down as a group, Ron. Yeah. And maybe the one thing that we know works with the thing that you know and leads someone, if not all of us, to this sacred treasure. I just, I want somebody to find it in the worst way. I do too. So does, so does Forrest. I know he he does. does. He does. Mm. I mean, there's a lot of, there's a lot of him in that chest. To be sure. He wants somebody to find it, but he's not going to give it to you. All right. So that's going to do it for this episode. We hope that you got some information on the Forrest Fenn treasure. If you'd like to know anything more or or leave a comment, please do below. I I just want to let you know that when you send us a comment, it comes directly to our phone, and uh, we respond to it as, as quickly as we possibly can. You know, it may be one minute, it may be 20 minutes, it may be an hour, but the point is, as soon as, at least if I see it, as soon as I get to it, I will send you a reply. Super responsive. Yeah, uh, and, and we do enjoy that. Uh, if you could, please subscribe to our channel. We would appreciate that a lot. It's very easy to do. You'll see that below as well uh, with our social media. Our website is menaresosmart.com, Ronnie. Yeah. And we're seeing a lot of good visits uh, to that website, and we appreciate that. You can see some of our videos on our website as well. Uh, let's see, sponsors. Thank you to our great sponsors. All of them make this show possible, and uh, we appreciate everything that you do for us, and um, thank you. All right, I'm Lou Gallagher. Corvette Ronnie. What do you say we knock off for the day, Ronnie? 
I'm done. I'm ready for a. It's like 11:30. Dirty, Woo-hoo! dirty martini. That's that's tough. That's a long day. Yeah, day you uh. <laughs> All right, we'll see you on the next. Men are so smart. Thanks for watching. Bye bye.